What I'd like to do is demonstrate some of what TradeShark can do today with some proprietary indicators. Before we get into that, I want to give you a little bit of background into why I use these indicators the way I do and why that would benefit you. And it's a, it's a perspective on this that other people generally don't have. And I, I want to give you the benefit of that, so you know, really pay really close attention the first 10 minutes. It's not heavy stuff, but if you can stay with it, it'll change your perspective on a lot of this stuff going forward. If we wind the clocks back about <clears throat> half a century or so, I'm a little sprout and um, sitting in a room watching a football game with my father. And uh, my mother comes home. She looks at my father and she says to him, or he says to her, why don't you sit down and watch the Browns game with us? She kind of gets a little upset and she says, you know I'm not interested the least bit in football. He says, well, I bet you'd be interested in it if you knew the house was riding on this. <laughs> it's not funny. That's the problem. It's not funny. <laughs> it became evident to me there's this spectrum between something crazy, wagering the house, because you might as well wager the sun and the moon and the earth and the stars and everything else, because when you lose the house, you might as well wager the whole Megillah and wagering nothing. A gentleman's bet, zero, one. And somewhere on this spectrum, we are when we make a trade. Whether we acknowledge it or not, we're betting the house or we're just sitting there as one of these old guys just watching the CNBC tape saying, I should have sold Apple. I could have sold Apple. We're somewhere on here at some value de facto assigned to us. So on every trade, we have a return, OK? R. And if I add 1 to that return, I have what I call a holding period return. So each trade, I can transform. Making $800, $800 on what? $800 on 100,000. Ah, 0.008. So yet 1.008 you've made on that trade. And by transforming these things into these holding period returns, we open the door into this fantastic but simple geometry that nobody's really looking at, that dictates to me, and I hope to you, what we should be doing in the marketplace, what we should be doing with our indicators. A lot of guys just go headlong into the indicators, and I want to show you why, why you want to look at things a certain way. So this return, R, is a function of that value I called F, fraction. That value somewhere on that spectrum between 0 and 1. OK, so if we make 8% on a given trade, our holding period return is 1 plus 0.08, 108. If we lose 5%, our holding period return is minus 0.95. Don't worry about writing all this down. I'm going to give you a link. You could download these slides when you're done. So that if you don't get it the first time, you can go back and refer to it and go, oh, I see it now. So we go on. If I take the product of all these holding period returns over a sequence of trading, I multiply them together, I get this. TWR variable, which represents what multiple I made on my account after these trades, OK? So it equals HPR1 times HPR2 times HPRQ for Q trades. And that can also be represented mathematically this way. And that's just the multiple I make then after so many trades by transforming them to HPRs. So we made 8% on one trade. We lost 5% on the other. 1.08 times 0.95, 1.026. So we made 2.6% on our account. Or you could say we multiplied our account by 1.026. Now, back to the gentleman's bet and dad's bet. If my F is 0, gentleman's bet, I'm wagering nothing, I end up with a TWR of 1 because my rate of return here is 0. 
One plus zero is one. I multiply a bunch of ones together, I'm going to end up with a multiple on my stake of one. If I wager nothing, my stake at the end of Q trades is what it was when I started. So this top line is how we can specify what we make on our stake after Q trades. And then we can figure from there, we can say, okay, so what do I make on average per trade? And that's just taking TWR to the Q with root, so that TWR equals G to the power of Q. In other words, we can use G, which is how much we make as a multiple on our stake per trade. Simple enough, simple enough. Back to our example. We had that TWR multiple we made on our stake of 1.026. Q is two trades, I don't mean to block you out there. So G, 1.026 to the power of one over Q to the one half power to the square root is 1.0129. That's the multiple I made on average per trade over those two trades. And you go, wait a minute. No, you made 0.08 on one trade. You lost 5% on another trade. I divide that by two, you made 0.15% on your money on average per trade, when in fact, you made less than that. You made 1.29% per trade. And here's why, and this is where we get to the revelation and the dictation of what we should be doing when we're trading. This is almost done, stay with me, okay? All right, now, I can estimate G, because G, remember, is TWR to the Q with root, Q being the number of trades. That equation, that's G, okay? I can estimate G if I take the average HPR and the standard deviation of those HPRs over my Q trades, I square the average, I subtract the square of the standard deviation, I take the square root, there's G, okay? Big deal, right? No, it is a big deal. Rearrange it, G squared equals A squared minus S squared, G squared, 1.026% equals 1.015% squared minus the standard deviation in those two trades squared, which I don't know what it is. Rearrange it again, the average HPR squared equals G squared plus S squared. It's the Pythagorean theorem that this stuff comports to. Right there, okay. Here's your average trade. Here is what you make on average per trade. If I make something on average per trade, raising it to the Q with root, the number of trades, is how much I make. So, Everyone's focusing on what they make on average per trade, whether you're right or wrong on a given trade, so on and so forth, without regard to the shape of the outcome of those trades. In other words, if I can shrink the standard deviation in trades, ceteris paribus, everything else being equal, the average trade stays the same, what I make on the average per trade goes up. If my standard deviation increases, the arithmetic average stays the same. What I make on the average per trade goes down. Now, there's a lot to this. We're looking at this in the context of traders. We're looking at this in the context of, <clears throat> excuse me, we want to maximize what we make on our stake over Q trades. But, there's all kinds of applications to this stuff. We could look at this and say, you know, it applies to any geometric growth function where there's a feedback mechanism, where what you have to work with today is a function of what you made or lost, what you accumulated or lost up to this point. Well, that's like the federal deficit, okay? And no one's, no one's looking at this, but if you could increase the standard deviation in period on period uh, borrowing, with the average period borrowing remaining the same, you could break the curve of that. And this same principle applies to us when we're trading. Now, I know you're thinking, if you're with this, you're thinking, well, how does, that, how does that work and how does that pertain to these indicators? Okay, last slide, ready? I call this the fundamental equation of trading because it tells me for given average trade, for a given dispersion in those trades, the standard deviation trades, and the number of trades, 
what I expect to make as a multiple on my stake. So this is our estimated G, which means this is our estimated TWR, which means what we make on our stake is the average trade squared minus the standard deviation squared, that quantity to the power of the number of half the number of trades. So the more I can increase my average trade, the more money I make. The more I can reduce the standard deviation in my trades, the more money I make. The more I can increase the number of trades in a given period of time, the more money I make based on half of the number of those, those trades, half that increase. <clears throat> and this then, if I look at, dictates to me how I want to be trading. In other words, there's any reduction you can get in the dispersion of your trades, in the standard deviation of your trades, equates mathematically to an increase that much in your average trade. Anytime you're able to increase the number of trades in that time period, all else remaining equal, you make that much more. So, ideally, you want to, I, I'm not saying you, this is what I would like to do, get a lot of trades off in a short period of time that have a tight distribution to them. In fact, what I like to do, did I miss it? Yeah. Each one of these is the trade, one plus the return, one plus the return, one plus the return. I don't like to have HPRs that are less than one. I don't like losing trades. Losing trades are for losers. I don't like them. And I want to show you how to get by with as few losing trades as you can, OK? <clears throat> because if I keep multiplying a number by itself, and that number that I'm multiplying it by is a number greater than one, that function keeps on growing. Similarly, if I can reduce the standard deviation in these trades, which gets squared, that difference gets squared, I do that much better. This is where tools like options really benefit you. Rather than getting hammered, I think it was in 1999, maybe 2000. Uh, Robert Rubin resigned. I had a boatload of S&P futures on, and I was less than a point away from my target. I'm in the Middle East, and it's night, and the US markets are open, da 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 And I'm waiting, and it's just sniffing my target. Just and all of a sudden, whoosh. And by the time I got out, my slippage started at 14 big points. By the time I got stopped out of there. And that, those big losses, remember, that difference to the average gets squared in terms of the damage to you. So a loss that's twice as big as what it might be is a lot more damaging to you than twice as damaging. Okay. Now, here's the S&P cash daily. And what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to put an indicator on here before I get to it. I'll show you what I'm going to do with it, OK? You can do this. I'm not going to tell you what the parameters are, because it doesn't matter what the parameters are. You use your own parameters. We work out about the same, more or less. I'm going to look at a day, say this day, that much range. I'm going to multiply the range times a multiplier. I'm going to add it to the open the next day, and I'm a buyer there. And I get out on entry day, plus one, plus two ticks, say. OK? Sounds like nothing. If it blows through my entry point plus two ticks, I'm out the next day on the open. OK? I can do this with options, or I can buy the underlying and buy a put in there and keep that put for a while just to put a floor on it, just to. There's a big gain to be had by truncating the largest loss. And that big gain comes by minimizing the standard deviation. Now, we have an indicator here in Trade Shark. And that's me. See? Looks good. Uh, and I'm going to put this price oscillator indicator on here. 
This is not like most price oscillators, by the way. This uses, in this case, it's using the last four bars, okay? The last four bars, but not so much change in price as it is the relative shape of the open, high, low, close of each bar. And I worked for Larry Williams for a number of years as a programmer to him in the 1980s. He had a trend following system based on this idea. I liked it. I managed to work it around for my own purposes into an oscillator for doing this, so I'll click Add to Chart. So, and here we have it. Now, 40 and 60 are the big bands on this. And this is just action of the previous four bars. This thing gets below 60. I'm only looking to be a buyer. Below 40, I'm only looking to be a buyer. Gets above 60, I'm only looking to take sell signals. Why? Because I want to minimize my standard deviation. I want to maximize my probability of it being a winning trade. Even if I have to forego other winning trades because I'm following that equation, okay, that I gave you. So I know if every time I multiply by the HPR of the current trade, if it's a number greater than one, I'm going to come out far, much farther ahead. Here's a day down in here. I'm looking to be a buyer when it gets to a certain range, probably, well, maybe, doesn't look like, probably got here on this day, closed. I'm out at the open the next day. Same thing, same thing. Until, well, let me get mouse cursor on here. I can probably show it better this way. Does that cursor show up on there? Until we get about here. Now I'm only looking to be a seller. But I'm not getting these days. Pardon? Okay, no, seen any big days, big days, big days. Now this day might have done it. This day probably would have. Now I would have sat through a bunch of heat until this bar here. I would have entered on this bar here. Okay, probably not gotten to my target. Sat through a bunch of heat and gotten out at a profit there. And I'm not worried about sitting through a bunch of heat. Okay, this is one of the reasons why I like doing this with options. Okay, I can sit there and I can have it go against me for a number of bars. And then here we see it again, looking to be a buyer, probably bought on this bar, out on this bar, only looking to sell. Don't see anything. And again, it depends on what percentage you use. Typically, you're going to use 60 to 90 percent, sometimes 100 percent of the previous bar's range with this indicator. That's one way to use this indicator. One way not to use it is with most price indicators, they'll talk about divergence and all that. And there's better price indicators for looking at divergence than this one. But by trading it that way, I enter today only in line with what the price oscillator says I should be doing. I'm just buying the breakout and I'm getting out an entry day plus one at a two tick or better profit. I want to minimize that standard deviation. And a lot of times, a lot of times they say I'm going to take heat and then I'm going to get out at a two tick profit. Big deal, right? You've minimized the standard deviation in that trade rather than getting stopped out at a much bigger loss, okay? Worst case, what am I out? The price of the option? So that's how I, I, I look at that price oscillator indicator. And that's how I use that in conjunction with a short-term system like that to get a very high percentage of short-term winning trades and just run them off one after the other after the other. Another market that this has worked very well on has been coffee. And here, I'm looking at it, but I could put, excuse me, Back on there. Here I'm looking to be a buyer. I probably bought it on this day here. I sit through some heat. And on this day, I'm probably out at my two tick profit. Maybe a buyer here, out there, looking to be a seller. Probably sold it on that date, out at a two tick profit. 
selling until it gets to here. Now I'm looking to be a buyer, but coffee's been a market that's worked well for me that way. In the coffee market, I'll trade just the futures, however, and I don't know if you want to do that. There's a lot of slippage. It can be very sloppy, but it's a market that has worked well with this type of approach and this type of oscillator, other than the big broad indexes. Lots of times on high cap stocks like IBM, stuff like that, uh, apples, you'll see this will work nicely with as well. Now I want to go on to the volume indicator, which is the one that I really like in here. That's, I'm just tickled it's in Trade Shark. And I look at volume for the broad indexes, not based on the volume that's going on in the broad indexes. But I found that if you look at the volume in the antithesis of volatility, option volatility is worked into an index, the VIX index. That's offered as an ETF, this VXX index here. And then it has an inverse, the, the XIV. And the XIV tends to follow what the broad index does. In other words, Volatility, well, let's see, here's the same time period. There's XIV, there's S&P, they tend to move together. In other words, volatility tends to have a negative correlation to stocks. So, as a great hedge for stocks, it's not a bad idea to have a stop order in to buy VXX at some price way above the market. I would have a standing order every day to be a buyer of VXX probably right around in the 3650 area. I don't want to buy it when it blows through there. I like to buy it just a little below, but that's how, how, how I like to do things. And it's not, I don't, wouldn't leave that as a GTC order, by the way, because if you do that, if I do that, the, I'll wake up one morning, it'll open up at 60, I'll be a buyer, and that's the high print for the next 10 years. So. It's much easier just to put those in every day as a day order, leave them only run during market sessions. Now, the XIV, this is a beautiful proxy for the broad market. And I say a beautiful proxy, it's a beautiful proxy in terms of the volume indications. Now, if I look at, I'm gonna add, I like to look at the bars of volume. And I look at, in effect, very high, very low bars of volume. They mean certain things. They have patterns to them, just as you have chart patterns and so forth. And I'll give you a link at the end of this talk that you can go into a write-up and you could download this. It goes into the basic patterns of this. But what's important here is in Trade Shark, Jim's managed to put these in in a colored fashion where I can actually see these things. Again, it's like looking for guys dressed in camouflage in the jungle. When I see it in Jim's work, I, I see it and I go, oh, there was a signal I missed and there was a signal I missed by not having it broken out in different colors. No, I don't want to do this. Take the third one down. Take the third one down and it won't show up again. Okay. Thank you. Never saw that before. <laughs> uh, and here's where this gets to be a great indicator. Anytime there's a colored bar in this, there's going to be a short-term change in trend most likely. And you can use this in conjunction with other indicators, but it tells me when to be super alert for things. So I'm not using it to trade the XIV. I'm using this to trade the broader S&P index, okay? But I'm looking at volume and XIV with respect to these volume bars and their rules, okay? So I can see that right up in here, we were moving up into this period. I'm looking to be a seller. Similarly, boom, you're looking to be a buyer. How long are the signals? Uh, they're good generally from about one out to four bars. Again, it's short-term stuff. That's the nature of how I like to do things. You can do this on weekly bars too, in fact, you could do it on one minute bars if you were interested in doing it. And some people might argue, yeah, but some days are holidays, some days are shortened market sessions, 
Uh, there's all kinds of dividend recapture programs going on. There's all kinds of HFT going on. Doesn't matter. It just it stood the test of time. I don't know why, but it has. High volume bars, low volume bars, and the patterns they make tell us when to be looking for turns. And again, here's one you see, and boom, we get into a little turn there. Top, boom. Here you have it again. This is an interesting pattern. When you get a bar where the close is way down near the low of the bar, that's telling you to be a buyer on the next bar at a lower price than the current bar. Where exactly? I don't know. Somewhere lower. Not much, but I mean, you want to be a buyer below that low. So somewhere near you'd have been a buyer in there. And these clustered up. You have to look at it with respect to what's been going on. This, this bar here was obviously into a little up move, so you look for a little down. Down and sideways, boom, up, a little down. And here we go again. So, and, and this is a very interesting one, this one of late. This would have told me here to be a seller. And I don't think we really got much of a sell. This thing has just turned right around on it just this last week here, okay? This move this last week really was a very interesting move in, in a lot, the way a lot of the technical indicators really got, got bagged pretty good on this. But you can see from this the turn points in volume on XIV and how they correspond to what's going on in the S&P. This is on 1.6, S&P, 1.6. It, it really gives us some very nice down to the bar to be looking for short-term turning points. Uh, this is a couple of very interesting indicators I want to get to here. Uh, I'll come back to this DBA at the end. This here, continuous crude oil. Now, a lot of these indicators, in fact, all of them, go back about 30 years. And Jim was able to program these up from some pretty archaic code that I have all this in going back then. These, to me, have stood the test of time. They're tools that I use to, to do what I've been doing. And one of the things I needed was a trend-following mechanism that was very fast, that didn't exactly wait for price to turn around if price was even starting to decelerate on a given move, it would go the other way. And here you can see this forward feedback, we call it, on crude oil. Like any trend following system, it's going to give you some whipsaws, but I like this as an adjunct to a lot of the other stuff we're doing. Using this with volume bars is a very good adjunct tool to use with that. Uh, another tool that's in here, and this this goes way back, and this is this red compression indicator. This is a weekly chart of the S&P. And this indicator tells me, okay, when do I need to really wake up and be on the lookout for a big move? And whenever this thing gets to a very low value reading, it's telling me, okay, we're going to see a big move from here coming up. We're going to see a big move. Now, this might not look like much of a drop, but that was a pretty good drop when that happened. Uh, this here, too. <clears throat> this, used in conjunction with a trend-following system, tells me, hey, I want to really be paying attention to a trend-following system giving a signal now when I get a low-value reading on this thing. And this is just looking at the previous six bars. The other thing it tells me is when it's topped off and rounded over, that's the end of the move. That's the end of the current move in whatever direction it's been in. And again, this is on weekly data. So here, that's the end of that move right there. So this is another very useful indicator that I use in conjunction with the trend following one. Here's a very interesting indicator. There's all kinds of ways of determining cycles within data. And one of the problems with cycles is they tend to flip. If I'm looking at something that's a 10-bar cycle, and I'm looking for a low to happen 10 bars from now, 
oftentimes, as soon as I see that, as soon as I can identify that, that 10 bar low is flipped and is now going to be a high in there. And it can really, really nail you. With cycles, you really got to use it with something else involved in there. So what I needed was a way to determine the cyclical content of data by restricting it just to, let's say, the last 50 bars, 60 bars, the last 10 or 12 weeks. And Jim was magnanimous enough to get this thing programmed up here. But what it is is a very robust way of looking at the last 10, 12 weeks of data and saying, here's the cycles that are at work in this data. Here's your dominant cycle. And here's where the turn points should be in the next week or so. So let me add this to the data. And you'll notice I've got, that's one day for a year. And one of the things I'm able to do in Trade Shark is I'm going to give it 12 bars to look forward. That's this little window in here, OK? So look forward. Show me what this is going to look like 12 bars into the future. So I go add this in, cycle determination, and boom. Now, I'm going to see if I can zoom that in. Uh, uh, uh. There we go. Okay. This looks at the cyclical content of the data. And it's come back and it said, you know, your dominant cycle in this data is 14, 15 bars. Okay? And that comprises 33% of the cyclical content of this data. That's pretty strong. And I say, okay. Show me that 14 bar cycle projected forward. And that's that red line there. So I can look at that red line and I can say, you know, if I look out at this day, 227, or 32 rather, see that up there? March 2nd, that's where that little high is on that dominant cycle. So I say, you know, I'd be looking for this thing to be working its way upwards into March 2nd. And then actually, based on that same cycle, to be working its way upwards into March 9th, OK? <clears throat> the blue line here is the composite of all the cycles. Remember, the 14-bar cycle in this only represents 33% of the cyclical content. But if I say, let me see a projection based on all of the cyclical content weighted by its percentage contribution, I get this blue line. And this little blue line pretty much gives me a little top around March 2nd as well. So I'd be looking for this thing to be working its way into a high around March 2nd. Now, here's the interesting thing. I know I've got a 14-bar cycle that's working very strongly in this data. Okay, So I'm going to add another oscillator in here that's part of this package. A time oscillator. Every oscillator we look at looks at price. What's price done over the last X bars? Blah, 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 blah. And here we're looking at, really, <clears throat> what's happened with respect to time? Have we seen a high or low within the last X bars? How's this thing shaping up on the time scale expressed as an oscillator? The reason I came up with it is because nothing else was out there giving me this kind of information. It's one of the nice things about Trade Shark is you can get this kind of information there. So, I'm going to go to the time oscillator here. And one of the things I'm going to do is, and this is beautiful the way Jim has this set up for us, I'm going to put in 14 bars. And because it's determined that the 14 bar cyclical contribution is the strongest, I'm going to add that to the chart. And boom. Here you can see it very clearly. What's been going on with this 14-bar cycle? And now you begin to get a picture of where we are in this cycle. This thing's really working its way up to a top a week from Monday, give or take a day, either side. <clears throat> I'm using other tools with this, but I'm very, very confident this thing is going to be seeing a high come March 2nd. And with that time oscillator, based on what the cycles have told us, this is like, looks textbook clear 
down here. So again, it's not using any one tool by itself, but using it in tandem. And this time oscillator, along with the dominant cycle when it shows up in the data, is a very useful tool for telling me where we are, what inning we're in in this thing. The cycle indicator, lots of times you'll get, oh, the, the two bar cycle is the dominant cycle. And when you get that, what you're looking at is a lot of mush. This 14 bar cycle, if it was the dominant cycle, but rather than giving me 33%, if it gave me 9%, I'm probably looking at a lot of mush. But here, 14 bars, that's pretty defined. 33%, that's pretty strong. If you didn't know that and you're just looking at the last 10, 12 weeks of data on that, do you see a 14-day cycle at work in there? I don't. It's like the volume bars. <clears throat> These tools let me see this stuff. Let me look at it graphically. And when used together, they tend to be pretty powerful tools, at least for me. It's been uh, extremely effective. I have a personal relationship with the Mendelssohn's. That's why I was flattered to have these indicators in their software. As I say, these things go back 30 years for me. I just found some notes on the cycle determination indicator in a zip file from 30 years ago. I was just telling Jim over lunch here, I wish I had that before you had to dig through my old nasty spaghetti coat on it to put it in here, but you can't get this on Bloomberg. You can't get this on TradeStation. These things are only available on TradeShark. And I like this platform. It's the only platform I use. Part of why I like it is because it's an end of day platform. I don't want to be sitting there on the intraday data. It's interesting for me to look at. I don't want to trade on it. That's dangerous. That's an invitation to losing trades, and losing trades are for losers. I don't want them. Okay, I can take any questions if you have any. Yes, sir. So let's take this for example. How would you trade that? Would you do your little uh, two tick uh, process or something on that, looking for that to break some point? Uh, on this particular ETF, no. Okay. There's short-term systems you could use for that. A lot of what I'm doing is accumulating a position here, okay? So when you say, well, how would you trade it? If in my accumulated position, I've been building a position and it's coming down and coming down, and I'm building this position, I'm building this position. If I have a target on it, okay, and we get to be around 3-2 and we're at or above my target, I am I'm getting out, okay? This particular market is just because it's one that I build a position in, and that's part of the way that I trade. I don't necessarily advocate that's how you do it. Uh, you could use the short-term system on this. These things are really surprisingly liquid, uh, but a lot of these markets, I try building a big, what for me, is a big position in. And Exactly. That's in large part how I do a lot of trading today, and I'll time that off of these indicators, but I'll keep accumulating a position on the way down. And I know a lot of people have a problem with that, and I'll keep accumulating it and accumulating it. And 2008 is an interesting story for me that way. I started acquiring some Midwestern bank stocks in the summer of 2008. And I'm writing puts underneath the market where I'd be looking to accumulate more. If I get put to it, that's fine. I'll buy it. And I kept on buying it. And I kept on buying it. And I kept on buying it. And I find myself in a hotel room in Boston and I got a little baseball coat and it's about 10 degrees outside. And I get back to my hotel room and there's a note there that because you've been buying so much of this, you're, you're all margined up, and guess what? These Midwestern bank stocks are now under $3 a share. You've got to cover this in cash, and you've got to do it by 9 o'clock in the morning, you little punk. 
So I'm on the phone with the great Mike Epstein, who is no longer with us. He's a great man. And he convinced me in his gruff voice, you've got to meet that margin call. You've got to cover that margin call. And I was trying to prove out this way of trading to myself. I had to prove this out to myself, so I had to meet this margin call. Somehow, by hook or crook, I had to meet it. I get the tea, I get a cab, I'm freezing, I get in there, I give him the check. I meet the margin call. Fast forward to February 2009. I'm sitting in an outdoor hot dog stand in Sarasota, Florida. I see Cora's bank shares print at 56 cents across the tape. It was the last position I had to get out of at an aggregate net profit. Next to nothing, I got out of it with a profit. I went through that whole traumatic experience, that looking out of a hotel room at 4 o'clock in the morning thinking to myself, how the hell am I going to do this tomorrow? But I did, and I got out of a negative at a net profit. Point is, I think, personally, there's a lot to be said for sometimes sitting tight with a trade, especially if you have the options, and just waiting until you can cash them out at a profit, you're multiplying by an HPR greater than one, it could be 1.000001, but it's a lot better than multiplying it by zero or even 0.6. When I'm building a position in a market that starts going against me and I continue to acquire it, I'm looking to get out at a nominal profit, if I can. The position's not working out for me. A nominal profit is infinitely better than a loss, and this tool tells me, you know, you're probably going to be getting a chance. Keep your eyes open because you've probably seen that nominal profit around 3.2 in this thing. And that's assuming, given the nature of this chart, that I was a buyer in bulk down there. May or may not be the case. Pretty much, in, in, in this market, okay? In a lot of ETF markets, and what I'll be doing generally, if I can, is rather than just putting a resting uh, buy limit under the market, I'm writing the puts. So I'm looking for, and this is a very important point, I'm looking for volatile markets because I like to be an option writer. And the more volatile, the better for me. And the point is, don't just look at volatility as a criteria, but the markets you trade in are probably as important as the techniques you use. Uh, you know, the f forward feedback is a great trend following mechanism. It did very nice on crude oil recently, very nice on British pound, very nice, very nice on any currency relative to the dollar, but in other markets, it's not so good. You've got to be very judicious in the markets you select to trade and what you choose to trade them with. It's, Part, partially answers your question. Another question about that. Ralph is a uh, uh, five time author. Um, some of the, the content written on his money management, do you have any questions about money management, trade size, uh, leveraging positions, anything you can answer for you from that perspective? Yeah, I've got a question. You were talking about buying all the way down, averaging down. I may not have been a buyer starting right up here, yeah. but I may have. <laughs> What percentage of the portfolio? Yeah. Well, let me put it this way. I'm, I'm set when I get into something doing it that way, as part of my 2008 experience, I'm set to take it to zero if I have to. Now, I may have to do some dancing to do that, but I'm going to tell you, when I put on that trade or any other trade, I'm ready for it to go to zero. I expect that, and I don't expect to see it in advance. When I hear guys telling me, well, you know, 2008 comes along, I'm going to sidestep at this, that, and the other thing. You want to the only top I ever saw coming was the top in 2000, where I loaded up on puts and ended up losing the money on all of them. They all expired on me. So I don't expect to be able to pick the giant market tops. That's not part of what I'm looking to do. But I am looking strategically to be able to put on a trade with these indicators 
take it going against me if I have to, and take it going against me as far as I have to, to see it through to, to, to being a winning trade. Yeah, but I wouldn't imagine that's a strategy for most retail traders that don't have 15 to 20 years experience and follow that right to get themselves out. They just don't have the nerve to do it. If, if you pre-budget for it, you can do it. Now, I'm not saying you have to do it. I'm saying this is part of why we go back to this shorter term system I was talking about. Let's say in the S&Ps where I get that little breakout. I can buy call options in there. There's all kinds of call options on those types of vehicles that are liquid as can be. Especially if you give them the spread, they'll meet all the liquidity you want. And your risk is now limited to the cost of that option. Is that comfortable if that goes all the way against you? No, of course not. It's not, it's not comfortable. Uh, but I'm saying it's a very viable way to trade. And in fact, when you look at it in terms of the equation of multiplying the returns plus one of subsequent trades together, to me, it makes sense to do it exactly that way. So you may not want to be a buyer of the PowerShares Ag Fund and be buying it in mass coming down. But you could be trading a short-term system with an option and take some heat on it. And again, I'm not minimizing what that's like. You know, when you're in a position and you're in an option and it's burning and it's against you and the talk is, hey, you know, you got your puts, but this market's going, it's going up a, a thousand S&P points here in the next week. That's not a fun place to be. That stinks. It's not so bad when you get out at a nominal profit because you get a chance to reload and do it again. And not every trade you get into goes against you off the bat. Let them go your way off the bat. I don't mind it when they go against me off the bat, by the way, because I'm writing puts on it, and it gives me a chance to accumulate a position. When I put a position on in something like this, I'm pretty agnostic whether it goes my direction or not initially. Now, if it keeps going against me, it gets a little more interesting as we go along sometimes. But, uh, same thing with, 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 with being long an option, but on a shorter time frame. It takes the same nerve to do it. It takes the same nerve to be long a call option or long a put option when that market keeps going up. And I say, you know, I put this thing on at S&P uh, 2000, and I'm getting out at S&P 1998 on the underlying in, the, in this option. And we might be at S&P 2020, but I'm waiting for 1998. What's the worst that's going to happen? You lose the price of the option.